Okay, how's it going, y'all? Today I want to go over uh, Bret Hart's really famous story, The Luck of Roaring Camp. And as we talked about last time in terms of Rip Van Winkle and place, theme, setting, things like that, I want to continue talking about the role of place in American literature. Again, this is Lucid Literature, and I am recording these series of videos primarily for my English 1102 class at Young Harris College. But, uh, if anyone stumbles upon these literary analysis videos and is intrigued, feel free to drop some comments down in the comment box, any ways that I can improve, anything I missed out on, etc. And I especially welcome the latter, because um, there are things I'm not going to be able to cover in these 10-15 to 15 minute videos. What I hope to cover, though, are the bigger points and the bigger themes. Again, specifically character, place, symbolism, and figurative language. Now, we'll get started here with the luck of Roaring Camp. Now, Bret Hart is a pretty prominent 19th century writer, um, but he is not as prominent, nor was he as uh, you know well-known, especially in the 20th century, as uh, his contemporary Mark Twain. Uh, nevertheless, Bret Hart contributes a lot to American letters, especially through his stories depicting the California Gold Rush. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, the 49ers, right? The football team, the 49ers, takes their name from the 1849 Gold Rush, when uh, a bunch of gold miners, speculators, and you know businessmen from the east east coast move west to mine gold, which is recently discovered in California and uh, in the West, more generally. Bret Hart is known for writing stories that depict characters, lands, and ideas associated with this major event in American history, the California Gold Rush. In this story, we have a scene of the Gold Rush at an actual camp that existed, a place named Roaring Camp. Very cool name, Roaring Camp, right? So this place actually existed. Now, an important thing to note here is a style of writing that was really in vogue in the middle part of the 19th century towards the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century is called local color. Now, what this style of writing entails is playing particular attention to a region or specific places, sociopolitical culture, regional dialect, local flavor, etc., to paint a broad picture of a place. This is highly place-based writing. And in doing so, what the writers are able to do is show a symbiotic relationship between characters and ideas and place. In other words, the characters and ideas create the place, and the place naturally creates the characters. We're also going to have this idea coming out of naturalism. The idea that no matter what you can do as humans, no matter what we can do as humans, nature is always going to look ambivalently at us, right? We don't control nature, right? Nature is neither good nor bad. Nature just exists. And if that existence means the destruction of, uh, you know, humanity or certain place-based, you know, areas, then so be it. And the reason I'm saying this about naturalism is because towards the end of this story, we're going to have a moment of natural disaster that impacts the story. In some ways, it's kind of like a deus ex machina um, uh, kind of conclusion, but we'll get there. So the luck of Roaring Camp. Talked about its setting, uh, set in 1850. Again, California Gold Rush, most prominent year was 1849. So we are thick in the midst of the California Gold Rush. The story starts off with this idea of unsettlement and discord and disjunction. There was commotion in Roaring Camp, right? It sets the stage for a town that is not cohesive, right? It's not, uh, you know, running efficiently and it's not well maintained, except there's commotion. The first details of the camp that we get are mired in violence, right? We get, uh, you know, this gunfight, we get, um, 
the, the gunfight between Fridge Pete and Kanaka Joe shot each other to death of the bar and the woman. Yada, yada, yada. And we also get, you know, a, a firm idea of where we're at. The ditches and claims. Okay, the ditches refers to, you know, the, the ditches dug for gold and the claims, claims to the land. All right. We also get uh, a really important character off the bat, Cherokee Sal, who we'll learn, we will learn is a prostitute. Now, the story doesn't come out and say directly that she is a prostitute, but we can piece together clues. Perhaps the less said of her, the better. She was a coarse, and it is to be feared, a very sinful woman. But at the time, she was the only woman in Roaring Camp, and was just then lying in sore extremity when she most needed the ministration of her own sex. All right, so we get the idea that she is a prostitute, and more than that, we get the idea that she has been hired by the camp to satisfy the needs of these less than moral men. The story opens up with her giving birth. Now, we don't know who the father is, again, laying testament to the fact that she's a prostitute, and also laying claim to the immorality of the menfolk of this camp, right? No one is, is saying that they are the father, and perhaps they don't know, right? So she has, uh, is going into labor. It will be seen also that the situation was novel. We're talking about the birth of the child. Deaths were by no means uncommon in Roaring Camp, but a birth was a new thing. People had been dismissed the camp effectively, finally, and with no possibility of return. But this was the first time that anybody had been introduced ab initio, hence the excitement. Now this is Latin, it just means from the beginning, right? So we get uh, you know, the idea that no one has actually ever been born here before, except for this child that is born from Cherokee Cell, a prostitute son, right? You know, one could make the claim that this is the first, you know, you know, you know, true person who lives on the land and is a product of the land. Okay. Uh, we get the villagers coming in, the the camp, uh, the men folk, Stumpy, Kentuck, etc. The miners come in and they decide who is going to raise the child, and we get great description. I want us to pay a description to the to the characters here, because this description does a great job of complicating their identities. The assemblage numbered about 100 men. One or two of these were actual fugitives from justice. So we get some criminals, some were criminal, and all were reckless. Physically, they exhibited no indication of their past lives and character. So we possibly get the idea that these men are escaping from something, from past lives. The greatest scamp had a Raphael face with a profusion of blonde hair. Oakhurst, a gambler, had the melancholy air and intellectual abstraction of a Hamlet. All right, so that's interesting. We're getting, you know, um, like the, uh, Raphael's kind of paintings. We get Hamlet from Shakespeare. I like that, the intellectual abstraction of Hamlet, right? So you know, th th this character may be moody, may be intelligent, may be uh, wafting between periods of mental clarity and mental insanity. The coolest and most courageous man was scarcely over five feet in height, with a soft voice and an embarrassed, timid manner, right? So this is interesting, because even though these men portray themselves as rough and tumble, they're not quite rough. The term roughs applied to them was a distinction rather than a definition. That's a great, that's a great sentence. What does that mean? Well, they aren't defined as rough. They're not actually rough. Calling them rough is actually an honor, right? A distinction. Perhaps with the minor details of fingers, toes, ears, etc., the camp may have been deficient, but these slight omissions did not detract from their aggregate force. The strongest man had but three fingers on his right hand, the best shot had one eye. So we get the physical deformities, we get the grotesqueness of these men, which is mirrored in their immorality, and we also get a nice contradiction between the grotesqueness of these men and the beautiful landscape, right? It's almost a juxtaposition. Such was the physical aspect of the men that were dispersed around the cabin. Now here's an important moment of place. The camp lay in a triangular valley between two hills and a river. The only outlet was a steep trail over the summit of a hill that faced the cabin now illuminated by the rising moon. The suffering woman might have seen it from the rude bank whereon she lay, seen it winding 
like a silver thread until it was lost in the stars above. Now, this is an incredibly important passage. Let's take it again. The camp lay in a triangular valley between two hills and a river. Now, we get the shape of the valley as a triangle. Now, I want us to do some abstracting. Why might the valley be the shape of a triangle? In other words, what are the symbols associated with a triangle? What is the symbolism of a triangle? Now, we know a triangle has three sides, right? Um, you know, a perfect triangle gives a sense of total completion or enclosure and entrapment. In some religions, triangle is perfection, uh, rebirth. We think of Christianity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? With this idea of three, the Trinity. So the triangle plays a very prominent role as a symbol. Triangle up between two hills and a river. The only outlet was a steep trail over the summit of a hill that faced the cabin. This is interesting because it suggests that the place, even though it's beautiful, even though it is full of fertility and birth, it's also in some sense inescapable. Much like these men's lives. They can't escape who they are, and they can neither escape the valley. And this is going to be important at the end we get a colossal flood that destroys. The suffering woman might have seen it from the rude bank by the it. We're talking about the trail over the summit of a hill. And it's interesting that Cherokee Sal, the last thing she sees is the way out, but she can't escape, right? She dies before she has the ability to make it out of this area, right? In many ways, uh, you know, her character is an incredibly tragic character, a prostitute um, who understands that she has no way out of her, you know, circumstance. Even in death, Right? Or close to death, she still can't get out. But in death, she does. All right, so the men and, uh, you know, everybody gathers around the baby. A fire of withered boughs added sociability to the gathering. By degrees, the natural levity of Roaring Camp returned. Bets were freely offered and taken regarding the result. Three to five, that Sal would get through with it. Even that the child would survive. Side bets as to the sex and complexion of the coming stranger. In the midst of an excited discussion, an exclamation came from those nearest the door, and the camp stopped to listen. Above the swaying and moaning of the pines, the swift rush of the river, and the crackling of the fire rose a sharp, querulous cry. A cry unlike anything heard in the camp. The pines stopped moaning, the river ceased to rush, and the fire to crackle. It seemed as if nature had stopped to listen to. Okay, so the baby is born, and the baby almost has a primordial, you know, before nature kind of piercing scream. A cry unlike anything heard before in the camp. You know, almost kind of like a godlike cry. The pine stopped moaning. The river ceased to rush and the fire to crackle. Almost as if the baby is in some way controlling nature, right? The baby is a product of the natural world and in some way controlling the nature. Almost as if the baby is a deity or a god, a Christ-like figure, come back to save the camp. We'll return to that in a minute. Immediately after the baby is born, or almost immediately, things start to change in the camp. Ken Tuck, a really rough guy, you know, uh, name implies that perhaps he's coming from Kentucky, but we're never you know, actually told that, um, becomes enamored with the baby, even though that he pretends like he's not, right? So he's uh, fidgeting or something, and the baby latches onto his finger, and he calls it the damned little cuss. And he keeps repeating that, right? And he even makes an excuse to go to Stumpy's just to see the baby again, even though he doesn't go inside, and there's kind of that awkward moment. So we get this idea that these rough, rough, rough men who, before the baby was born, prided themselves on this kind of perverse masculinity, are starting to fall in love with this kid. They're experiencing love. They're experiencing redemption. They're experiencing innocence. Right? These men haven't experienced innocence 
since they were perhaps children, if at all. And with this baby, they're seeing what innocence looks like, what a child looks like that hasn't been tainted by the gambling, by the death, by the hardships of living in the mid-19th century. They are moved, as if this baby is a Christ-like figure. So we go through, um, Sal dies. The next day, Cherokee Sal had such a rude sepulcher as Roaring Camp afforded. After her body had been committed to the hillside, so from dirt to dirt, dust to dust, there was a formal meeting of the camp to discuss what should be done with the infant. A resolution to adopt was unanimous and enthusiastic, but the animated discussion in regard to the manner and feasibility of providing for its wants at once sprang up. All right, so the, the, uh, the men decide who's going to raise the baby. Stumpy takes it. But things start to change in the camp. The men start washing themselves, bathing themselves. It says the camp is starting to regenerate, right? To regrow itself. They become healthier. They take the baby to the places where they mine and they start finding gold. They put the baby's bow up above the ditches and the ravines where they're mining and they find gold and mica and pebbles and all kinds of good stuff. And as a result, they name it Luck. Thomas Luck. Now this is important because this is the title, right? And it, it, it works on two levels. On one hand, the literal level of the Luck of Roaring Camp refers to the baby. This baby is, you know, the Thomas Luck of Roaring Camp. On the other hand, though, it's referring to the abstract idea of luck, right? The good fortune of Roaring Camp. So it's interesting how it works on two levels. Right, so the men, everybody starts, keep going down, they start uh, really improving. The camp improves. They can see a future, possibility, right? Before the baby was born, there wasn't really a future because nobody was born there. Everybody kind of died, right? Nobody was born. And in some ways, this becomes a symbol for this idea of manifest destiny, which is going on at this time, the belief that uh, you know, based on an uber sense of nationalism and in and, 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 and many ways kind of a perverse sense of uh, you know, rightful ownership to the land, you know, people started to believe wholeheartedly in this idea of an American, truly an American identity as a way forward, American exceptionalism. The baby seems to represent this American expanse, this luck, this American luck, this American fortune, this American will, this new society of California. The baby symbolizes all that. However, it's all for naught. And this is one of the parts of the story that I, I think could have been expounded upon. We almost get to the conclusion, it's like, and then a flood wiped everybody out, right? Um, the story loses some kind of progression for me. Um, I think it could have been a bit more drawn out, but... The winter of 1851 will long be remembered in the foothills. The snow lay deep on the Sierras, and every mountain creek became a river, and every river a lake. Each gorge and gulch was transformed into a tumultuous watercourse that descended the hillsides, tearing down giant trees and scattering its drift and debris along the plain. Red Dog had been twice underwater, and Roaring Camp had been forewarned. Water put the gold into them gulches, said Stumpy. It's been here once and will be here again. And that night, the North Fork suddenly leapt over its banks and swept up the triangular valley of Roaring Camp. So again, this idea of Roaring Camp as both a fertile place of life and growth, and also an enclosing place of death and destruction, right? The triangles, uh, or the valley's triangularity is both uh, a cause of its fertility and its its growth, and it's also a, uh, it leads to, um, you know, the destruction of the settlement. So nature, as both a benevolent force and as uh, if not malevolent, then ambivalent, right? So if malevolent, malevolent is bad, ambivalent is uncaring, right? Is neither good nor bad, just is. <laughs> 
and the confusion of rushing water, crashing trees, and crackling timber, and the darkness which seemed to flow with the water and blot out the Fear Valley, but little could be done to collect the scattered camp. So we get, again, the idea of place not as a you know life-giving place setting. It is one of destruction. Which makes the story kind of sad, or really sad, right? We see change in these men just for everything to be wiped away, right? Just like the Triangular Valley, with its seemingly inescapability, there is that one trail. Can these men truly escape who they are, their misfortunes, their life? It doesn't necessarily seem that. But we do at the very end get that final beautiful and sad moment where Kentuck and Luck are dead, both die, but Kentuck is holding the baby as if trying to save the baby. Kentuck, who at first, you know, for the baby is the damned little cuss and pretended not to like it, pretend to be uber masculine and not like the baby. He dies. Which is sad for the, the, the town because Roaring Luck was going to be something. Such was the golden summer of Roaring Luck. This is before the flood. There were flesh times and the luck was with them. The claims had yielded enormously. Found a lot of gold. The camp was jealous of its privileges and looked especially on strangers. Now, this is an interesting moment because we get a sense of like the anti-immigration sentiment. Um, and this is important because Hart is going to write a lot about anti-immigrant views in the mid to later 19th century. He's going to write a famous poem in which he critiques anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, but much to his chagrin, the people who most enjoy the poem are missing the satirical uh, nature of the poem and take it literally. And so they really like it and it kind of in some ways increases anti-Chinese sentiment. But Luck, he seems to be, or, uh, Hart seems to be speaking on this uh, idea. So perhaps they're, you know, even though they do improve, they're improving, they're regrowing, they're building, they even have plans to, um, you know, make a hotel, they're not going to get any more prostitutes. They seem to be growing in some ways from a moral standpoint. Is this also making them very insular and provincial and anti-immigrant? And is that a reason for their destruction? At the very end, we get this final image of water, right? So just as the story starts off with commotion, we get this final moment of commotion, right? A river, even when it's calm, is still a object of commotion. It's always flowing, it's always changing, right? And the river is a perfect metaphor for this, right? The processes of life always changing, cannot be contained. Yes, my man, you are dying too. A smile lit in the eyes of the expiring Kentuck. Dying, he repeated. He's taking a me a with him. It kind of sounded like Mario. Tell the boys I've got the luck with me now. And the strong man clinging to the frail babe as a drowning man is said to cling to a straw. Cling to a straw, right? That's actually like a, um, I think of cling to a straw, uh, you know, a bit of luck. You know, the shortest straw has to uh, do something bad, you know, like pulling straws, right? drifted away into the shadowy river that flows forever to the unknown sea. Right, so it er, ends with this idea of water washing away everything and entering it, uh, erupting into the sea, flowing into the sea. Okay? So again, to sum up, we get this idea of place as both benevolent and ambivalent. Uh, we get the idea of this ambivalence, this complication of place made manifest in the characters themselves, right? We get characters who are you know, at the beginning, they seem to be kind of immoral, but they also seem to have hints of goodness. The baby is born and they, you know, become more moral. And then at the end, you know, it's almost all for naught as everything is destroyed. So we kind of see place in them, the setting in them. And we also see the ways in which they impact the setting. Okay, everyone, hopefully you got something out of this. Uh, you know, if you would like to discuss anything else, this is my class. You know, please leave a comment and I will catch you all next time. All right.